I'm sure everybody is wondering what we could learn from the angel of death, Joseph Mengele. Um, well, I'm not sure we could um, learn too much, um, most likely, but I'm hoping that I can convince you otherwise, that there are, in fact, uh, lots of um, things we can learn from history. And one of the important things um, about education um, and WAMO certainly has a role uh, to play in education, is to learn from the mistakes of the past. I, can, um, I would submit to you that um, history repeats itself. That is, it is back to the future. That there are many things that, many uh, related issues that are somehow resurging themselves in contemporary society, back to the days of Joseph Mengele. And that is what my topic is about. Through the voice, uh, through the eyes, and through the ears of our children. We all were children once, right? We have children. Our parents were children. When we speak about these issues, we must think as if we were in their shoes. Joseph Mengele obviously didn't care about any of the children that he experimented on. Joseph Mengele was a physician. He swore to the Hippocratic Oath. The Weimar Republic uh, were one of the most advanced in society. They had an ethical code, just as we do. But he still did the horrific experiments on the twins, and most of them died. Fortunately, some lived and could tell us their story so we could learn from their terrible experiences. And if anyone has had a chance to um, listen to his son, in fact, his son is, his son is a lawyer, and... <coughs> I actually took steps, and um, Dr. Hennant would know that I, I tried to search for him to bring him to this uh, talk. He actually gave some interviews about his visit to Joseph Mengele, who died after having a stroke uh, in Brazil, and he was the one that uh, evaded capture. But he visited his father, and he never forgave his father. So Mengele did a lot of unlawful, terrible, cruel, barbaric experiments on twins. This is just uh, a small list of them. I had um, some email exchange with um, Eva um, Kaur because I was also contemplating um, uh, bringing someone who's, who experienced this um, very um, crazy, uh, um, very um, tragic historical uh, events uh, to, to our, our, our conference. Uh, unfortunately, she's too unwell. Um, sh she, however, uh, if you look into her story, she forgave the Nazi doctors for what they did to her and her sister. We have to accept that. I'm not sure that I could um, accept or forgive um, uh, uh, someone who did such uh, uh, barbaric experiments uh, on me when, uh, when uh, I was a child. Uh, but we have to accept uh, different people's uh, responses. So uh, even before Mengele, uh, the Nazis had a euthanasia program. They actually killed people with disability 
minors, the physically and mentally ill. And many, uh, many countries today are going back to assisted dying of people who are mentally ill and who are disabled. So how did Mengele justify, he swore the Hippocratic Oath. He was trained in ethics. He was a researcher in anthropology and medicine. How did he justify his actions? Well, he said it was for the greater good. If it was for the good of Germany, for the good of their society. Well, lots of what we're doing in child experimentation and I will get to that later in, in my talk, is for the greater good of medicine. But is, is it always right? And we have to have rules in place, protections in place, because children can be easily exploited from improper experiments on them today. So the Nuremberg trial. So a 33 Nazi doctors were convicted and 28 of them were hung for what they did. And arising out of the Nuremberg trials, there was a Nuremberg Code. So what did the Nuremberg Code stand for? The Nuremberg Code stood for the fact that you can only do experiments on people that can consent. So the Nuremberg Code, the rule of the Nuremberg Code was so strict to protect children because children generally cannot consent. So the Nuremberg Code essentially did not allow any experiments on children. No state adopted the Nuremberg Code. So as a result of uh, World War II and all of the crimes of uh, humanity and, and um, <clears throat> many deaths of uh, Jewish people, um, minorities and other uh, unnecessary deaths, there were a lot of, um, a lot of uh, legislation and declarations that arose, in, including the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that, as everybody knows, protects the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and to not have cruel and unusual punishment. So following the Nuremberg Code, the Declaration of Helsinki relaxed the rules a little bit. So the Declaration of Helsinki allowed for some substitute consent by a parent and for child assent. And then it only allowed therapeutic research on children. What do I mean by therapeutic research for children? Well, there is a difference between therapeutic research and non-therapeutic research. So the research that was envisioned in the Declaration of Helsinki were research that have some sort of benefit to the child that is subjected to the research. So that it's, a, it's research on the condition that they have. In my respectful submission, the Declaration of Helsinki got it right. But we've gone past the Declaration of Helsinki and we're exposing children 
who cannot lawfully consent to non-therapeutic experimentation. So what that means is they can't even benefit. They're doing, they're being enrolled in the studies for the greater good. Scientists may say that if you don't do those um, experiments, you won't be able to help any future children. So a lot of the new conventions, uh, in fact, broaden the rights for experimentation on children. And just to uh, duplicate what um, Roy spoke about, that it's also included in the Geneva Convention about that it's uh, unlawful to do experimentation on prisoners of war. So these are some of the reasons that justify exper non-therapeutic experimentation on children. I'm not gonna read the, the list out, but there are reasons that justify it. So let, let me uh, see what the audience uh, thinks. How many people think that child experiments, so we have uh, an eight-year-old that goes to your local hospital and gets asked to enroll in, ex in an experiment. How many people think it should just be an experiment if it's about them and it helps them? How many people think that that, that should that that limitation should be uh, the right way to go. How many people? Okay. How many people think that children should be uh, exposed to experiments that don't benefit them, that might be beneficial for the greater good? How many people think? Okay. All right. So. So um, what uh, steps are taken in, in various countries that do allow non-therapeutic um, experimentation is that it must have minimal risk. So if children are, are enrolled in studies that are non-therapeutic, that have no benefit to them, they have to be ones that expose children to minimal risk. However, part of the problem is most of the time you don't know all of the foreseeable risks that you're exposing children to. And I would submit as well that there is a much higher standard for informed consent for research as opposed to medical treatment. The other um, issue that um, is somewhat provocative is whether during the times of uh, torture and experimentation on prisoners of war that occurred uh, by Mengele in Auschwitz, whether any research that is gained from those experiments should be, in fact, uh, used for the greater good. And in fact, Asperger's syndrome, now autism spectrum disorder, is something that actually arises from uh, experimentation by the Nazis. And that, that's what justified the name um, change. And many of those children, many of those autism spectrum children we're euthanized, but we still obviously use the research today. There is uh, connecting to the um, the event tonight, 
the uh, cinema tech event tonight. Uh, I, I want to advise you that there is a recent really troubling um, experiment that took place in New York where they made a movie about it. It's called The Three Identical Strangers. So everybody should have a look at it. At it. The Three Identical Strangers. And, and, it, and it speaks to the, the, the philosophy of the researcher and the, sometimes the philosophy of the review boards that are reviewing whether research should pass muster or not. What happened with the three identical uh, strangers, there were triplets that were born. And child, the Child and Family Services took the newborn babies, put three children in three separate families, one rich family, one me, uh, middle class, one poor family, and they let them grow up. And they did experiments without uh, telling the parents and went without, um, in fact, telling these children. And in fact, they, they found each other accidentally. So they, they ran into each other, they found each other without anybody telling them. And they were very traumatized by, by the whole experience. They all developed uh, depression and one of them committed suicide. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real story. So there's lots of, uh, of non-therapeutic experiments that are um, of dubious quality that exploit and expose children to non-foreseeable risks. So that, that psychiatrist who put those babies in three different homes with a rich family, a middle class family, and a poor family, never thought that 20 or 30 years later they might have some mental illness that developed from what was done and that one of them would kill themselves. So in conclusion, we can learn uh, lots from Joseph Mengele. We can learn what it is to uphold our ethical conduct and not do things just for the greater good, just to publish more, just to be part of the, the group. And that we do have to turn our mind to those experiments, particularly those experiments that have no therapeutic benefit for children, to ensure that there actually is minimal risk and to think about all foreseeable risks so that we protect our children because our children are vulnerable. Thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, uh, free to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you.